This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Hello, my name is Gerard Robinson. I am the host of In Character. And as you can tell, I'm out of character right now in dress. Uh, I'm actually coming back from an appointment and I'm not gonna make it home in time, but I wanted to make sure I kept my commitment to Chad and the conversation we're gonna have. And as an educator, he can appreciate that at times we have to pivot. And so this is my pivot moment. So Chad, welcome to the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I, I am really enjoying your uh, pivot right now. I wish I would have pivoted and put on a, something more comfortable now. Exactly. <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't had a chance to watch uh, Chad and his group uh, talk about uh, education, particularly the leadership side of it, uh, I won't give you a spoiler. But he's got a really interesting background and decided to become a teacher. He's also joining us from Hawaii. Uh, so I want to thank him for uh, make, uh, doing this in terms of the time change. But since we're talking about leadership, um, you were an athlete. You know, played football and basketball pr pretty much my entire life. My dad was a football coach. My mom was an athlete. My little brother is an amazing athlete. Um, was this in, in a neighborhood where sports were life? You know, I grew up in the south side of Cleveland where um, you know, when you're born, you're essentially given a football and you don't have a choice on who your teams are. You're a Buckeyes fan and you like the Cleveland Browns, whether, you know, whether I think that's been a lifelong curse, sadly. Um, and, you know, in high school, I pretty much, you know, the way that I look back at it was, you know, had good grades so I could be eligible to play. Um, and so college was a, always, you know, that was what my, my career path was going to be. You know, we always, it was never not going to college. Just, that was the trajectory. Um, and, you know, played football well enough that I had opportunity to go to and play at the next level. I always dreamed of playing in Ohio Stadium in front of 105,000 people. My talent, my size had other, had, uh, other uh, ideas. And luckily, I landed at a, division, a small Division three school on the east side of Cleveland, John Carroll University. Um, it's the Jesuit school. And I went there to play football. Had no idea what a Jesuit education was. I just knew that I had an opportunity to play quickly and that um, I had a chance at wearing my number. Um, you know, it sounds like shallow, but for an 18 year old, that's a big deal. Um, and so I landed there and, and from the moment I got there, just I realized that there was a lot more opportunities on campus than I had anticipated. And so I got there really to be a football player. And really what happened was I think I became a young man and realized that learning was actually something I enjoyed doing. And I don't know if I really would have said that had I went to another school. And so when, uh, yeah, when, I, when I got to John Carroll, um, for those of you who don't know a Jesuit school, you know, it's really, you have to take philosophy classes and religious classes. And I, I grew up in pretty much a non-religious home um, where we were, we were, where, you know, we're given the keys to explore uh, as many ideas as possible. I grew up listening to punk rock and hip hop. Um, so I had avenues of thinking outside of the status quo. Um, I, I learned about what was happening in, in cities like New York City and Los Angeles through the music I was listening to and the injustices that were happening. When I got to John Carroll, it was really about Okay, what can we do about these justice, these injustices? Um, it's not just thinking about them, but it's really kind of putting them into action. And so, in the philosophy classes I was taking, and underneath this Jesuit education, I started um, really understanding that these things that I've been wondering about and thinking about, there are other people who had spent their entire lives thinking about and writing about, and I was being exposed to them. But I wasn't just being exposed to books and ideas; I was really being exposed to other perspectives by hearing what my peers had to say. You know classes were small, 12 kids sitting in a circle. And I wasn't good at this idea of thinking like that at first because I hadn't been trained in it. And I'd been trained in memorizing information and regurgitating it out on a, on a Scantron. Um, and so I really kind of dedicated myself to, okay, this idea of wondering and, and, and thinking outside of the box, you know, that's what people say, but really thinking about these complex issues and thinking about what can I do to, to, to be part of the solution. You mentioned throwing, so you were a quarterback. I grew, up, I grew up as a quarterback, um, but I slowly transitioned to a defensive end. Yeah, when I, when I was in high school, my, uh, I started both ways, but I was an offensive center. I'm sure you and I could have been a great uh, tandem. Oh, uh, for sure. From the high to the throw. So you've done a great job talking about your intellectual growth. Uh, you studied philosophy, my undergrad degrees in philosophy, so that's another soul brother thing that we have in common. You know, right now, there's a great deal of conversation about whether or not uh, college athletics should go on as we know. Uh, it's raised the bigger question of whether or not 
uh, student athletes are really athletes who happen to be students. Uh, you've seen this. Uh, you also work with uh, young men uh, and other student athletes uh, who are also women. You know, based upon what you know as a leader in the role you have now and where you started, speak to how we as educators, as policymakers, really as people who want to see something happen to young people, how should we think right now about this moment and how much should we really emphasize the push for sports versus the push for academics? Yeah, I think this is a really complex uh, situation and, and I don't know nearly enough to make a, you know, a, a, def a profound statement on it, um, you know, do like there's all these health concerns and whatnot. And I think public health obviously is at the forefront, but having said that, you know, I think that coming from, from an educator, but also someone who really loves sports is, of course, I would want to see these, uh, these young athletes have an opportunity to, you know, display their talents and really kind of engage in what they've been working their whole lives for. And, you know, the, the last few months really kind of dedicating themselves to their craft. Um, but on the other end, um, I think that there's a, li a little bit of a, a, I think, confusion setting in. You know, the university I teach at right now is 95% of the classes are offered online. And so how can we expect student athletes to report to campus if we actually don't want people who work on campus to show up on campus? I understand that there's also, you know, tons of money and, and whatnot that's, you know, intertwined in all of this. But from, a, from the student athlete's perspective, if I can rewind myself, you know, 20 some years ago, I think I'd probably want to play. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is that we have a time clock and I just don't know how much time it would be left on my clock. Uh, and the idea of too, is I was probably ignorant um, to the fact that, oh, if I get sick, I get sick. You know, not really, I would hope that I would see the, the bigger, the bigger uh, implications of, of playing, you know, getting, you know, a hundred guys on a field at one time. Um, together. So I think from, from a parent standpoint, you know, my kids are only two and one. I don't have to make these decisions yet, but we sent my, my, my two-year-old son is in face-to-face -face preschool today, you know, so um, granted his class size is only five kids and it's a really small bubble, but um, I think just understanding the protocols and if everyone takes their role, I think we can begin to move forward. You know, the Big Ten just decided today that they're going to play, um, which I think is a big step forward. Um, but also, I think, what, what are the safety protocols that are going on? So I, I know I'm not really answering your question. I just am kind of identifying all the different perspectives. Um, and most recently, the one as the parent. No, in fact, you answered my question in a very nuanced way, which is exactly what I was looking for. Parent, athlete, administrator. You're in Hawaii. When we think about Hawaii, we think about sun and fun. Uh, I was fortunate in my family, uh, two of my three daughters and my wife had a chance to visit within the last two years. People really don't have any idea about the challenges with poverty, uh, with history, I, colonialism, all that that feeds into what we know as the Hawaiian education system. Talk to us about why you decided uh, to work at the university level and what are you doing in your role to try to address some problems that many of us just don't know a lot about? Well, that's a huge question. Uh, you know, dissertations have been written about this, so I'll do my best to answer <laughs> it. Um, uh, and, and understanding my perspective, you know, uh, as a, a foreigner who, um, who moved here and my, my wife is, is half Hawaiian, um, is a Hawaiian language teacher. So I think that I have, uh, I have a, a growing understanding of, of the history of Hawaii and its people. Um, for those of you who don't know, Hawaii was a sovereign nation until the United States military illegally overthrew it um, in 1893. Um, and, you know, since then, it's, I mean, even before then, you know, since, the, since Captain Cook and the first Westerners stepped foot here, there's been a long, difficult road of um, colonialism where their language um, has been, you know, taken in a lot of ways, or they weren't allowed to speak, uh, they weren't allowed to dance hula, surfing, all of these things that are very part of who uh, Hawaiians are as people um, was taken away from them. And slowly, um, the culture is being built back up um, with, the, with much intention. And I think that what's happening in, uh, in the Department of Education schools, I, I'd say rough, beginning in the 1970s, really kind of taking a, a, a page out of the book that was in New Zealand, you know, very similar history, is beginning to establish charter schools where Hawaiian language is the main mode of, of, of language spoken and really trying to reestablish uh, who, the, who the Hawaiians are and their role and who they are as people to reclaim their history, um, to reclaim their identity. And I think um, you know, that, that movement is, is very much in full swing. 
However, I don't know how many, you know, if it's really kind of become part of the, the state or excuse me, the nationwide movement here in Hawaii. And uh, what we're doing at the university is that what we're really doing is we're in the teacher preparation is we're trying to get our students into uh, schools from the get go from the beginning of their from the beginning of their teacher ed program. Um, because many of our students did not go to school um, necessarily in areas where there's high Hawaiian populations. Um, and so what we've done is we've created partnerships with schools where uh, we're, we're creating this network for K through 12, where we're really trying to get students on campus to learn from the students, to learn from those teachers that are on there. Um, so we can really understand our place but also how we can become part of these communities. So rather than having this missionary savior mentality when, when teachers go into classrooms and schools, it's really about how can we become part of the community um, and see and, and live in that community. And so I think what we're doing is really trying to create these partnerships and, and granted we can do a better job of doing this, but it's really been a focal point of the program that I'm in is like social justice, this community action is really a, a piece that we want to ingrain in our students. Um, you know, for example, one of the projects that we do is from the very beginning is they have to go out and interview people in that community. They have to walk around the community. They have to understand who they are, who they're teaching and where they're teaching before they can even begin to consider what they're teaching. And so I think what we're doing is just trying to be very, very mindful because the University of Hawaii is a Hawaiian place of learning. And I think that the university struggled with what that means, but there's definitely a growing understanding amongst the faculty on what our role is in helping uh, achieve that mission. The campus where you work, is it the campus for those who want to become teachers or is it one of several campuses with a teacher uh, prep program? Oh, great question. So there's 10, there's 10 uh, campuses in the UH system. I'm at the, I'm at the flagship one, University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, where uh, the, the, I, I would say the main teacher education programs are. However, there are some satellite ones at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and also in some of the uh, community colleges where they can get um, AA certificates before coming to UH that translates directly over. So we're not doing all of it. I think that we're probably doing much of it though because this, the teacher preparation is a statewide system here. Or it's a statewide program. And so we have students from you know, remote places like in Hana Maui um, and Kauai who are zooming into our classes um, in order to be with their peers on Oahu. So we actually went to a complete synchronous online uh, program four years ago, well before the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit and we all went to Zoom, we had been on Zoom for several years. So um, yeah, we're at the main teaching uh, campus. That's actually a good point. Uh, because of geography, you had to get it ahead of the game mm -hmm. on technology. Yeah. So when, when this hit, you were there. Um, what percentage of the teachers in the, uh, in the classrooms are native Hawaiians? You mentioned you come from Ohio. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Um, I think it's very, I don't know the actual numbers, but I would guess it's relatively small um, compared okay. to the number of teachers. I think there's 13,500 public school teachers in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I do know that there is a movement, it's called Grow Our Own, um, to really get people from the communities in which our schools are settled to get those community members to become teachers. And so what the, the government has done is they've allocated you know, lots and lots of money you know, to, to have people from these communities get their teaching license. Because I think, and I mentioned this in our conversation before, was what, what, what had happened, I think beginning in the 90s is we, the, Hawaii started going outside of Hawaii into the continent to really recruit teachers from teacher prep programs, you know, on the East Coast um, to get teachers to come to these schools that are quote unquote hard to fill. And what would happen was these teachers would stay for a year, two years, three years most, and they're out of here, you know, and that, that's not doing anything to create community. It's not doing anything to really help establish a culture of learning when we constantly have these new teachers coming in who don't have any investment into the communities in which they're working. You know, they're, just re they're waiting to go back to New York or wherever they're from um, because they be become homesick or they're in challenging spaces. They don't understand the students they're working with. They don't understand the history of Hawaii. They don't understand just the, the basic language that's being spoke. You know, it's not standard English for the most part. And so I think there's all these challenges that uh, going outside of Hawaii doesn't, do not help. Um, and so I think that grow our own our Grow Our Own initiative 
is a step in the right direction to really start getting those who are leaders in their communities to really kind of step into the classroom and, and really become a, a, more, uh, a, a more impactful aspect of our children's uh, learning environments. Well, it's definitely something that uh, I will promote and, and learn more about and definitely let us know what we can do to help. Chad, thanks so much for opening up your personal and your professional life, for taking time to talk to us about uh, why you're in teacher prep. And more importantly, also telling us about what you do uh, in Hawaii. Again, we've got sun and beach and surf, and that's a part of it, but people actually live there and they call it home. And you've just opened up one aspect to us, and I'm sure there'll be a number of people who watch this and who listen who want to be helpful. So uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you.